Thank you, Prescott. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of the same sorts of themes and topics that you've heard a little bit about before, but I think I'm gonna take maybe a slightly different approach in some cases um, and address a few different aspects of some of these questions in some cases. So hopefully, um, for those of you who are gracious enough to stick around all the way until my talk at the end, um, we'll find new insights in this talk as well. But first, I want you guys to do something for me. I want you to take a minute and picture the average dog the first thing that comes to your mind, and I really want you to do this. So picture its shape, size, color, behavior, and demeanor. Do you have this dog in your mind? Hopefully you do. All right, if this is the dog you pictured, then you're correct. <laughs> Actually, this is my dog, this is Ember. Um, and this might be the first dog that pops into my head when I think about a dog, um, because this is my dog and I see her every day. Some of you may have thought about your own dogs or maybe about the dogs you've heard a lot about in this conference or seen a lot of pictures of in this conference, maybe the village dog. Um, but certainly you all probably drew something to mind and this is what we call in psychology a prototype. So we have a tendency to come up with a concept of what something is that pops into our head when we hear a particular word or phrase. And this is useful because it saves energy, um, it's quick to bring to our minds, and we can use these concepts or prototypes to talk quickly about subjects, um, and it allows for efficient communication. But in reality, um, dogs are diverse, and we have heard some debate about how diverse dogs really are, or whether maybe just certain populations of dogs are diverse. But even if we're not looking just at their shape, their size, their color, their fur type, um, we also have diversity of niche. We have diversity in the types of roles they play in the lives of humans. Um, and we have diverse behaviors among not only groups of dogs, but also among individuals. So the question becomes, what about cognition? So we hear a lot of things about cognition. You've heard a lot of things today. You've probably heard a lot of things before. Things like dogs follow points, or dogs take the perspective of others, or dogs are social but not physical problem solvers. You may have also heard that dogs are wolf-like or that they're human-like. And the question becomes, which, if any of these things are true, how do we know? Um, and is there really just one type of dog cognition? And so I'm gonna try to address some of these issues today. So we're gonna quickly revisit one of the examples you heard about before, a popular measure of social cognition in dogs. And this is the human guided object choice task or the pointing task. And so just as a quick recap, basically an experimenter points to one of two objects. The dog then has the opportunity to make a choice. It can approach the container that the person has pointed to. This is a correct response and the dog gets a piece of food or it can go to the other can or do something else, um, and this is an incorrect response, and in this case, they get no food. So the question becomes then, or the common thought, um, is do dogs follow points, and many people will say yes. So I wanna show you a study that we did not too long ago, where we looked at the point following ability of 31 domestic dogs, pet domestic dogs, and what we found, if we lumped all of these dogs together and we took the average, if that's what we were looking at in this study, we would find that on average, dogs perform significantly above chance. Dogs follow points. Now, in the study, we weren't looking at average performance of dogs. Actually, I was asking a question about breed. Now, there are many different ways of asking the breed question. Um, you can basically take breeds of dogs that have been selected for different things, and many of our modern breeds are actually selected for what they look like, not what they do. But there are some breeds of dogs, especially along working lines, that are still selected for based on their behavior, or components of their behavior. Um, and so one of these, for the example that you see there, is the Border Collie, that is selected for, to some extent, based or bred for, um, on the basis of some of that predatory sequence that you heard Catherine talk about. And there are other breeds like this as well. And so as Catherine described, um, in the wolf, we have this predatory sequence, and I didn't take it all the way to the end, um, but the first component of the sequence is orient, eye, stalk, chase, grab bite, kill bite, and then it goes all the way through to dissect. If we look at some breeds of dogs, like Airedale Terriers, they actually have this whole sequence intact in the adult form all the way through from beginning to end. But as Catherine mentioned before, some breeds of dogs, for example, Border Collie, 
as adults tend to show or exhibit the first part of the sequence but show inhibition for later parts of the sequence. So they orient and then they have an exaggerated eye stalk and chase component um, whereas the grab bite and kill bite are inhibited. And then you've got some breeds of dog, maybe, like Anatolian Shepherds or Livestock Guardian Dogs that actually show an inhibition across that whole predatory sequence just like you heard before. Um, and basically this is useful for them because they need to stay with the sheep. They need to not run after those moving objects. They need to stay in guard. Now the point or the aspect of this predatory sequence that I was most interested in in the case of pointing um, was this very first component, the orient, eye, stalk, and chase. And you may ask, how does this have anything to do with pointing? Well, after working with wolves and dogs an awful lot um, and watching a lot of videos of pointing tasks, it became clear um, that when you are asking animals to watch you engage in movement, um, and then ultimately you want them to follow this movement to consume food, the task is actually kind of similar to what you might expect in a predatory task. And indeed, when we watched some of these videos, the behavioral components that we were seeing exhibited looked an awful lot like the predatory sequence. So I'm going to go back to that original graph where I said this is the average performance of those 31 dogs. And this is what we could have done, and we would have found that dogs follow points. But this is what we actually did. So these are the individual performances of the wolves in 2008 that Clive talked about, just for comparison's sake. And then the individual performances of dogs from each of those breeds I mentioned before, Airedale Terriers, Border Collies, and Anatolian Shepherds. And what you're looking at is the individual number of correct choices, the number of times that individual followed the point to the container, to the correct container. Now all of these dogs are herding stock, or not herding stock, all these dogs are working stock, so the Border Collies are herding stock, um, but they were living as pets in the human home. So their lifetime experiences were not as working dogs, they were as pets, but they did have that herding, guarding, um, or terrier active hunting lineage. And what you see here um, is that you can see, still see that average bar where that average performance lies, but you see individuals that are performing above that bar, you see individuals performing below that bar, but you also see trends across breed. You actually see that the terriers who have almost the same predatory pattern as wolves perform a lot like wolves on this task. You see the border collies that are exaggerated in that component of the predatory sequence performing really, really well. And in fact, um, an additional thing to note, although these weren't performance dogs in any manner, the three top performing border collies also happen to participate in agility. So it's kind of interesting. But even without them, you can see the rest of the individuals are performing quite high. And then you have the livestock guarding dogs that are performing generally below that average bar. There's some scatter, but they're not performing very well. And if you look at just at the individual level, the number of individuals that are performing significantly above chance on this task, which is an 80% accuracy rate or higher, that's pretty typical, that's the typical criteria, you actually see that none of the livestock guarding dogs are passing, the border collies are doing very well, and the terriers are kind of in the middle. So you might ask at this point, is using averages wrong? And no, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying average data is incorrect, but I am going to suggest that average data is a tool, and it's a tool for a very specific purpose. Averages are usually used to represent populations of animals um, or people or whatever it is that you're measuring. But we have to keep in mind that averages can be deceptive. And this is especially true in some cases when the population that you're studying, the numbers get very large, we tend to sort of lose um, sort of the sense of individual variability that might exist within that population. So in other words, if there are some individuals that are performing exceptionally well and some individuals that are performing exceptionally poorly on that task, they sort of get averaged together and you get a number somewhere in the middle. So it is possible to have a data set of individuals, half of which perform at 100% accuracy, and half of which are performing below chance, and get something that's somewhere in the middle that we might say is successful overall. And that's not very representative of those individuals in that population. So in some cases, the averages um, are useful, and sometimes they are very representative, but in other cases, they're not. And what's interesting when we talk about dogs following points is that we hear time and time again, pet dogs follow points. 
But actually, this study is not the only one that suggests that that's not true in every case. In fact, there was a great study in 2009 by a completely different lab, actually by someone in Adam's lab, that showed even though 180 dogs, when averaged together, were performing above chance levels, more than half of the individual dogs that made up that average in that study were not performing above chance. In other words, more dogs in that study were not following points reliably to the container than were. So that's kind of interesting. So when we ask something like, do dogs follow points? I think the accurate answer, at least at this point, is it depends. Sometimes they do, um, but sometimes they don't. And some of the things that we've looked at over the years are things like breed. So you just saw an example of how breed might factor in. Age, we've found that over four months of age, oftentimes dogs do better on these tasks than under, um, but that can vary based on experience or location. Pet dogs versus shelter dogs, you saw an example of that. Um, whether they have experience or not, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's sort of context specific. There are a lot of different things that can contribute to dogs' ability to follow points. And so another point I want to bring back to this breed study is that we can look at this one group, we can look at the Anatolians and say, they are not performing well on this task. And one suggestion that you could make is that, all right, maybe the Anatolians lack the cognitive capacity to follow points. After all, this has been used as a test of social cognition. But if you look a little bit closer and you ask what's really going on, if you remember, it's not that Anatolians lack those components of the predatory sequence, and Catherine mentioned this as well, they're inhibited on those components, meaning that it's, they potentially can display them under the right context or the right um, situations. And so what we did in this particular case is we gave Anatolians, just like Sh Clive mentioned in the shelter dogs, we gave them additional chances to follow the point up to 40 trials. And so what you're seeing here is the data from six dogs that we could sort of re-enroll in the study because we came up with this afterward and went back. Um, and so you see the original score of these dogs out of 10, the number of times they followed the point to the container out of 10 in the blue. And then the orange is the number of trials it took them to reach criterion, to follow that point at 80% accuracy or better. And what you see is that when we kept pointing at those containers and the Anatolians finally caught on, this is what they want us to do, um, all but one became successful on the task. So it wasn't that they necessarily didn't understand the point or that they couldn't follow the point, it's just that they weren't following the point. And possibly one reason that this might have been the case is because these particular individuals or this breed is supposed to show an inhibition to following movement. Um, and the point essentially taps into those same principles. So what is dog cognition? And we've heard a little bit about this, and I'm gonna to touch on it several times throughout this talk. Um, but one of the things that we need to think about is that dog cognition may not well be predicted, or an individual's dog cognition may not be well predicted by averages alone. There are a lot of things that we need to consider. We do need to consider evolutionary history of dogs. Um, we need to consider the background of particular breeds, but also development, context, and learning. All of these things work together. They're interacting together, um, and they're really inseparable, even if we try to study them separately. But some things that are interesting about dog cognition um, that do seem to be true is that it's adaptable. To some extent, it can be individual. It's contextual. And I think most importantly, we should recognize that it is influenced by us. Our dog's cognitions are influenced by us. So a few years ago, um, we did another study. And we titled it, Can Your Dog Read Your Mind? You've heard a little bit about this one already. Understanding the causes of canine perspective taking. Now, we weren't really asking whether dogs could read our mind, although some people did interpret it that way initially, um, and I got a lot of emails. <laughs> but really what we were interested in is understanding about what people tend to perceive as theory of mind. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting point, and I will make um, sort of a commentary on it because it was brought up and just to sort of frame the rationale for asking these questions, why we were interested and sort of point out that just because a scientist asks a question, like, does a dog potentially have theory of mind or asks about this hypothesis, does not necessarily mean um, that the scientist asking the question is setting out to prove that that is the case, or it does not necessarily mean that they even believe it's the case. And I think Alexander provided a great example with the guilty look. 
Um, she did a study on the guilty look because she was interested in a phenomenon that owners believed were true, um, not necessarily a pho phenomenon that she was setting out to promote. Um, and so that was sort of the case in this particular circumstance. It seemed interesting because owners have a general sense that their dog knows when they're looking at them and knows something about what they're thinking. So just a raise of hands, how many of you think that your dogs know when you're looking at them? Okay, I do. How many of you think that if I walked up to you while you were looking at your dog and put a bucket over your head, that your dog would recognize that you could no longer see it? A few people. So the bucket's over your head that you can no longer see the dog. Okay, at least a few of you. And these are the types of questions that we're asking about. So this is sort of the overview of the study. Imagine that you're at some sort of sporting event and you want food from a vendor, right? Let's say you want a hot dog and you're at a baseball game. So you could ask from this guy, you could try to wave him down for the hot dog. You could ask this guy, you could try to wave him down. But all of a sudden, you spot this vendor. Who would you ask for food from? I would pick the third. Um, because that guy's looking right at me, and I feel like I probably have the best chance, especially not being the loudest person or the tallest person, um, of getting his attention. He's already got his attention, um, and so I can hopefully get that food. Now, what's interesting about this is that this has been tested in a number of other species, and it's also been tested in young human children. And chimpanzees, under certain conditions, especially lab reared chimpanzees, do not do especially well on this task. However, some socialized chimpanzees with training can do better. And even human children do not do well on this task up to a certain age. So children under the age of five are hopeless at this task for the most part. There are some individuals that do better, but by and large, it's kind of an unusual thing. But as we get older, this becomes almost a silly concept to us because it becomes so easy. So what we did in our study is we asked canines the same question. Would they be able to detect who the best person was to beg for food from? And so you already saw this set up, so I won't go into any great detail. But basically, the idea is you have two people, one of which is looking at the animal and can see the animal, and the other which is not. So in condition one, and I'll ask you first, who would you ask for food from, A or B? B, good, and it was almost universal, so we're in good shape. What do canines do? They do the same thing. So it's very good that you are not outperformed by the canines. <laughs> Everyone's on the same page. Um, by and large, and you can see these are averages, and what's great is that Adam provided the individual data. So if you want to see the individual data for this, which I felt really bad for not putting on there, um, you can turn to page four of his notes, and you can compare it with the individual data. Um, and you'll actually see that in this particular instance, the individual data, while there is variability, fall along pretty well with the averages. Um, the averages are fairly representative, especially in the higher realms, especially when you get the 83% and 93% correct. So they do well on this. Now, one of the things about this that we thought initially was quite interesting, and I still think is kind of interesting, is that initially it was thought that dogs probably should do well on this type of task, and there had been a lot of studies showing that dogs did okay on this sort of task, and you saw another one previously. But the wolves also do pretty well. The wolves also know to beg from the person who is looking at them. And this was kind of contradictory to a prior view that suggested that this was very difficult to induce in wolves, even in human socialized wolves. Now, do I believe that there are wolves that will not look at people or look at their faces in order to receive food or for any other purpose? Of course. There are probably the majority of the world's wolves are not gonna you know, come right up to somebody and beg for food. But under the right conditions, under the right circumstances, individuals that have been intensely human socialized and have had life experiences where people give them treats, especially when they come up and look at them, are doing pretty well on this task. And that's the case at Wolf Park. These wolves are intensely human socialized. They get treats from people often. In fact, if they come up, um, there are a couple of wolves that they come up and they look at the caretakers, they get a treat. And when the caretaker turns their back or when someone turns their back, they recognize it's a sign of inattention and they go into the next person who's looking at them wielding food. So in this particular case, these socialized wolves, like the dog, did not beg from an inattentive caretaker. And maybe this isn't so surprising, because all of these groups, whether pet dogs, shelter dogs, or wolves, 
probably had experiences, plenty of experiences, even in their current environment, where people walk up to them, are looking at them, provide them with treats, and when they walk away, that attention is withdrawn and their chances of getting whatever it is they have has gone down dramatically. So here's another potential condition, and this is another condition that we ask. In this case, who would you ask for food, A or B? Okay, so now the occluder is a book, not the back turn, but that makes no difference to you. You still know that we should beg or ask for food from the person who is looking right at you. And so we asked the same question again of dogs and wolves, and you've already sort of seen this data. Um, but again, you see that the pet dogs are doing very well. They make this discrimination. They beg from the person looking at them. What's interesting now is that we see the performance of the wolves and the shelter dogs drop to chance. Why is this? This is kind of interesting. Well, I would argue um, that one potential hypothesis here is that we spend a lot of time, or at least some of us spend a considerable amount of time, engaged with things over our faces like books, like magazines, um, that our dogs have had the opportunity to experience walking up to us um, and not getting what they're looking for. Some of us might give in, there might be some individual variability, but by and large, having books, newspapers, magazines, tablets um, in the house and reading from them and being distracted from your dog is not an unfamiliar experience. But for the wolves, um, this is probably a little bit less familiar, at least in recent times. We do sometimes read with the puppies, um, but once wolves reach adult age, not too many people go into the wolf pen, sit down, and open up their best book and just sort of ignore the wolves running around them. Most people have enough sense to keep their eyes on the wolves and know what's going on. So they don't have as much exposure, at least in adulthood, to the stimulus. And shelter dogs that are currently living in a shelter, at least their most recent lifetime experience, there are often not a lot of people going in and reading with the dogs, especially not in the shelters that I was working in. So this brings up the role of the environment. And we've already seen lots of pictures of all the wacky things people can do with and to dogs that are just not part of their typical environment around the world. But we do lots of special things with our pet dogs. In fact, to many people, their pet dogs are their family. So we might treat them like children. In fact, places like PetSmart and Petco make their employees call dogs, or they call the owners pet parents not owners, um, to sort of recognize that this relationship is, is something special that these owners are going to want acknowledged. We spend billions of dollars a year on dogs. They're, you know, sometimes in our beds. We feed them. They're living with us. They go on trips with us. They have a very special lifetime experience compared to a lot of other animals. And so when we see them engaged in tasks that look similar to the things that we would expect from humans, or we see them engaging with us in ways that seem like they're really attentive to our behavior, we can maybe imagine why they do this. It's to their advantage um, to be responsive to these people that control their resources um, and really engage with them in a very unique way. So maybe it's not so surprising that they do exhibit some unique behaviors. We treat them very differently. Now, another thing I just want to quickly point out, since I heard most of you flipping and you probably still have that page open, um, to the point where you see the quote where it says, dogs do not display an undifferentiated sensitivity to all visual cues of attentional state. And it was initially pointed out that, well, actually, pet dogs do do pretty well on that back turn condition. They do do pretty well on that book condition. And so maybe that's not a fair statement. Maybe they are generalizing. Well, what's unfortunate about that is that just like context can affect behavior, Context can also affect words and the interpretation of data. And what you don't have on that slide is the bottom half of the graph that shows this next condition, the one I asked you about before. There were actually additional conditions to this test. And the next condition was, do dogs respond to somebody who's looking at them more often than they respond to someone with a bucket on their head? And if you want the full graph and you want that full data, um, just let me know and I'll make sure you have it in context and have the whole paper. But here's the question, so I'll ask you again, who do I beg from, for um, food from, A or B? A. Okay, just making sure you don't have a side bias. I did switch it this time. And that seems almost ridiculously easy to us, right? Because a person with a bucket on their head surely can't see us. It's an obvious visual cue. It's almost ridiculous. But what's interesting is when we give this same problem to the canines, they have a real hard time with this. 
they almost all want to beg um, equally from both people. They don't seem to show that same discrimination that we were seeing before. They'll beg from someone with a bucket on their head just as often as they'll beg from someone looking right at them. Now, there are a few individual exceptions. In fact, seven individuals out of the total 32 did show a slight preference for the person looking at them. But that's still the majority of dogs not really caring. That's kind of interesting, since we pretty much all unanimously um, picked the person looking at us in this case. Now, this brings into the question of, are these dogs really taking the person's perspective and recognizing that the key feature here is whether or not the person can see them? Or are they relying on past experiences to tell them under what conditions it's most likely they will receive food or not? And so we see that, you know, in general, all of them can respond to a person looking at them versus back turned. They've all experienced that. Pet dogs do very well in the discrimination between someone looking at them and a person with a book, but wolves and shelter dogs do not. And now we have putting a trash can on your head, and we did indeed ask the owners, how many of you walk around at home with a bucket on your head? And not a single one volunteered that they did, although you know, some of those seven might be suspect. <laughs> but they wouldn't admit it. So you know, life experience is having some influential role here. And so some of the dogs might be generalizing. Some of the wolves might be generalizing. But by and large, it does seem to be a context-specific thing. And so if you break it down even further, I think also kind of interesting is that of the individuals who did preferentially choose the person looking at them versus the person with the bucket on their head, five out of the seven were pet dogs. And so pet dogs do have, again, that more enriched life experience. And even though people might not admit to having a bucket on their head, um, lots of children put things on their head. People wear helmets and other things over their head. Um, so it is possible that there is learning potentially going on there. It's just hard to pinpoint. So we don't know for sure that's what's going on. Um, but we do know in a follow-up study where we were able to train dogs that were approaching indiscriminately to significantly approach the person looking at them versus a person with the bucket on their head if we gave initial, additional trials. So we know it can be learned, but we don't know whether it's generalization or something else going on here um, for these dogs that succeeded outright. So one important point I want to make, and I know you saw this slide before, but now one word is highlighted. Um, and that isn't to signify that this word is more important than the others. It is not. Um, so like I said before, all of these things work together. It's an interaction between evolution and development and lifetime experience, environment, context learning. These things are all working together all of the time. But it's often thought, or at least in the last few years, an argument has been made that there's some sort of distinction between you know, learning or you know, explaining behaviors by learning versus explaining um, behaviors by a cognitive explanation. And that just isn't true. Learning is a part of cognition. And learning is a real thing, so we can't get rid of it. Whether it's social learning, Pavlovian conditioning, operant conditioning, learning is happening as Clive demonstrated all of the time, whether or not we mean for it to, whether or not it's intentional. And it's interacting with these other lifetime processes or evolutionary processes. And so this is really important and really significant. Now you might say, why is this important? Well, because learning is happening, whether or not we're intending it to, it's affecting the cognition and behavior of our dogs on a daily basis. So at home, when somebody feeds your dog from the table, that dog is likely going to learn something about that person, maybe that that person's an easy target, or maybe that learning from begging at the table is OK, um, or maybe even that when somebody is glancing at them or looking down at them, they're more likely to provide food. Um, but they are potentially learning these things, and that is very meaningful. And it's meaningful um, because, again, a dog's cognition, a cognition, not just behavior, but the whole package, is potentially shaped by human actions, expectations, and also the environment that we create for them, for those dogs that are living with us. So yes, you do influence your dog's cognition. And what does that mean exactly? Well, it does mean behavior, um, but it also means things, not just the overt behaviors that we see, but the potential and capacity for behaviors maybe that they haven't exhibited yet. We're influencing those too. Um, we're influencing rate of behavior. We're influencing communication, reasoning, navigation, memory, problem solving, the whole gamut you could potentially be having some sort of influence over. Um, and even though those individuals might come into the world or co might come through an evolutionary history of certain predispositions, tendencies, 
um, attitudes that they share among a species or among a breed group, we can still have an influence on those things in their lifetime. So let's look at another example. For many years, across many species, um, there's a task called the unsolvable task that has been used to look at both physical and social problem solving skills. And the task can vary quite a bit, but the setup is generally the same and it's pretty simple. There are two phases, a solvable phase and an unsolvable phase. Now the first phase is just really the setup. So we give an animal a solvable task, a really easy task. So for example, we put a piece of food on the ground and we put a cup over it and that's it, that's the setup. For the animal to be successful, all they have to do is walk up, sniff the cup, basically it topples over, they get the food, they're successful. So that's the setup and there are different ways you can do this. Now the experimenter creates an unsolvable version. So they do the same thing, they put a piece of food on the ground, they put a cup over it, but this time that cup has been glued to the floor. So in theory, that animal now should no longer be able to solve the task. They go up, they sniff it, it's not working, they can push with all their might, but the cup, in theory, should not tip over, and I say in theory because a few dogs, a few wolves in every one of these studies sometimes does manage to beat the experimenter, <laughs> basically. But the idea is that it's unsolvable. And so when faced with an unsolvable task, there's one really important finding that seems to sort of resonate and stand out for people. And that is, wolves persist and continue to try to solve the task. But if a human is nearby, dogs quickly stop. They almost immediately give up and they look to their human, right? And the story has often been that dogs are looking to their human for help and they recognize that they can't solve this task and so they don't waste their time, like the silly wolves, you know, trying to get into this task that's truly unsolvable. And that sounds pretty clever. But I wondered, is it that the dogs recognize that this task is unsolvable um, or is something else going on? Because after all, the solvable version was so easy, it wasn't challenging at all. We don't necessarily know what dogs would do if confronted with a task that was indeed solvable, but required a little bit of effort. So that's what we did here. We compared dogs and wolves, actually pet dogs, shelter dogs and wolves, um, in a version of this task that was indeed solvable, but basically was a creation of a Tupperware container with, you can see I've modified it with a rope to the top to make it even a little bit easier, and I put a big hunk of summer sausage in that Tupperware, sealed it, but it's not glued down. So the animal could potentially get that lid off, could crunch through it, could knock the lid off, pull it with it by the rope. How it got into that didn't really matter, but they had two minutes to try to get that food out. If they got it out, they got to eat the food. So pretty simple setup. So what did they do? This is the number of individuals out of each group, out of 10, that managed to get the container open and eat the food. <laughs> zero pet dogs, zero shelter dogs, eight out of the 10 wolves. Dogs are not looking so clever anymore. It's unfortunate. So the question is, what's going on here? And a long time ago, um, there was a hypothesis, I think, I believe it was started by Harry Frank, although others may have been working on this as well, um, initially that maybe dogs were more socially oriented, social problem solvers, and wolves were physical problem solvers. Now later on, he revised his belief about this a little bit. Um, and so he wasn't, I, I think, you know, towards the end of his series of experiments, um, he wasn't quite so sure that was true. But others since then have said the same thing, that maybe dogs are more socially oriented, wolves are more physically oriented. But when you actually look at the video and what's going on, I think you'll see something interesting. So we're gonna take a look. Fingers crossed that it plays. So what you see here is a wolf, Miska, and a dog, Zoe. And they both had a chance to sniff the container. It was pretty quick, so you may not have gotten a good glimpse, but you can look at the next video. They both sniffed the container, but you see immediately a change in behavior. Zoe is just sort of sitting there. Oh, it's playing. Are you checking to see this playing? Yeah, Zoe doesn't move the whole time. You'll see that again. Um, so it doesn't look like Zoe's moving, but it, it is. And Miska's trying like crazy to get this problem solved, to get that piece of food. And you'll see in just a second, although it's kind of small on my screen, I think Miska's already got the food. Right, 33 seconds in, and Zoe sits there for two minutes and does about that. Um, you will at one point, don't click it to move, because you will get to see her move, just to prove that I'm not making this up. Yep. Her owner moves and she looks up, but that's the only time is when her owner actually makes a movement. Um, so it's not like she's sitting there staring at her owner, she's just sitting there for most of the trial. 
Uh oh, what's going on? <laughs> okay, so there are a number of things we can look at, um, and one of them is, well, are the dogs really interested in the food? Well, this is a big hunk of summer sausage, but for those of you who are in doubt, um, if you actually look at the amount of time it takes each species to approach the container to sniff the food when their owner is holding it and when they place it down, dogs actually approach the food source the quickest. They're ready to get this summer sausage. Um, they, lip their li their, sorry, they lick their lips um, and even beg from their owners as they carry the container to the start point. Um, and if you give them the food after the whole experiment is over, they do eat it. So they do appear to be interested and motivated by the food. However, when we actually look at what they do, once the container is set down and the owner is instructed to step away and just not do anything, um, we see that the pet dogs and the shelter dogs do almost nothing for the entire trial, and that's pretty consistent. Um, they do not touch the object for very long, they barely look at the object, and they don't even spend that much time looking at the human. They spend most of their time you know, sort of sitting around. Now, in all fairness, they do look at the human more often than the wolves look at the human, um, but you can see that it's not that much. And really what the wolves are doing most of the time is trying to solve the problem. They're looking at the object, they're solving the object. And what's interesting is these are results are for um, the data when the human is in the room with the dog and the wolf. And you might ask, well, what do they do um, if the owner wasn't there? I bet the dogs would solve it then. What's interesting is they do just about the same thing. They still just sit there. Um, obviously, they can't gaze at the human because the human's not present, um, but they spend about the same amount of time engaging with the object, which is not very much on the part of the dogs and a lot on the part of the wolves. So at this point, I became worried. I thought, maybe I think this task is solvable by dogs, but maybe the Tupperware just really is too difficult for the dogs to get open. Wolves have these stronger jaws. Um, maybe I'm making an assumption I shouldn't have, and maybe the dogs know it. Maybe the dogs recognize that this task is maybe somehow unsolvable for them. So about that time, I got my border collie, who was eight weeks old, and I said, I'm going to let her to try to solve this task. Because if an eight-week-old puppy can do it, then I know that this task is solvable. She's small, Josh, she's tiny at this point. You'll see her in a second. Um, and you'll see a comparison to one of the other adults um, whose owner is actually probably watching right now. So hi, Ryan. Um, you're going to see your dog in a second if you're still watching. And these are both herding breeds, an Australian Shepherd and a Border Collie. And what's interesting, I think, is you see Ember, my puppy, almost immediately starts engaging with the object. Heidi's interested. She's smelling. She's sort of making contact. We would still count that as contact. But Ember is staying in contact with this object the entire time. She could care less about me. You can see my sock because she's so far away from me that she, you know, it's hard to get me in the frame. Um, and Heidi's being a little bit more cautious about it, so she's investigating. And then eventually you'll see Heidi shift into what most adult dogs do. They sit and sort of hang around. Heidi does look at her owner more often than typical for adults. But in terms of engaging with the object, she's pretty typical. And Ember has it solved. <laughs> in fact, she's so enthusiastic about engaging with the object, she doesn't realize she's solved it. Um, <laughs> we have to show her that she can indeed eat the food because she's already done. And that is actually now her favorite toy. She runs around with a thing in her mouth and whaps people with it, and she thinks it's great. And you can see Heidi still hasn't solved the task, and that's very characteristic of adult dogs, at least so far, at least pet dogs. So there are a number of possible reasons for this, and we're actually doing follow-up studies now to figure out exactly what's going on. But there are potential hypotheses that we can look at. Um, one, it might be that the young of a species, especially dogs, are still developing some sort of social cognition or social responsiveness to people. It hasn't fully developed, so maybe you know, their physical problem solving is all that's left. Um, I don't think that's especially strong, but it's a possibility. It might also be that young individuals are more likely to engage with novel objects. Um, and this one seems to have a little bit more promise because if we compare that to the human literature, we also see that if you place down an object, not necessarily a problem, but just any old object in front of a baby or a toddler, what do they do? They grab it, they put it in their mouth, they put it on their arm, over their head, between their feet, whatever they can do with it, they're touching it. Whereas if you put it in front of a teenager, probably just sit there and look at you, they don't spend as much time manipulating those objects. And there's actual scientific studies showing this. So that might be one potential factor. However, that doesn't explain the difference between dogs and wolves. So it's probably not the whole thing that's going on. 
Now the other factor is we asked the owners in this study, how often do you scold your dogs for getting into sealed containers? And eight out of 10 said, yeah, we do that. We scold our dogs for getting into sealed containers. And so it may just be that puppies and young dogs have less of a history being taught that they shouldn't investigate new objects or shouldn't dig into things um, like containers that are sort of not theirs. And in fact, we have a lot of problem with this. Maybe as owners and trainers, when we have puppies, they're investigating and they tear open things all the time. Um, and so maybe they just haven't been taught not to do this yet, or maybe it's a developmental and a learning factor. And with the wolves, you know, they're in their enclosures, they're able to dig into logs, they tear open carcasses, and so ripping open things for food is not all that unusual to them, and it's not something that they would be punished for. So if this was a potential influence, a potential factor, we might say, well, what if it was okay that the dogs are tearing into this container? In other words, what if the owner encourages them to do it? And so here you're seeing the same dog in two conditions. The owner stands neutrally, or the owner encourages verbally or gesturally, but she can't touch the dog or the container, and you can already probably tell which is which. If not, the labels are underneath. This is the same dog. And in the owner neutral condition, we see the very typical behavior of sort of hanging out, standing around, sitting, occasionally looking, but not interacting all that much. Uh -oh. You can see someone's videotaping, but that's true in both conditions. You can see in the encouragement condition, Harpoo stays in contact with the object the, almost the entire time. And just here, she solves it. Now, how much of an improvement is this overall? Well, you can see the data we collected on the bottom. Now, only one out of 10 pets when encouraged, and only four out of 10 shelter dogs when encouraged actually got the container open. This is an improvement to zero, for sure. Um, but this is you know, not 10 out of 10, or eight out of 10, like we saw in wolves. But what we do see here is that even if they're not getting the container open, they're spending a lot more time in contact with that object trying to get it open. Um, so they spend, instead of less than 10% of their time in the case of pet dogs, now they're spending about 50% of that time, a full minute of the two minutes, trying to get the container open. And shelter dogs, you also see that big improvement. And again, they're not spending as much time in contact with the object as the wolves, and that might be why they're not getting it all the way open, but they're spending a lot more time in contact with the object and increasing the odds that they'll figure out the problem dramatically. And so maybe two minutes isn't enough time to overcome a lifetime of being scolded for tearing into objects. Maybe they aren't great problem solvers or physical problem solvers at this point, especially after many, many years of being told not to engage in this sort of activity. But we can find them trying if they are encouraged. So what does this study mean? What, is, what are we concluding from this study? And I also use the, the term captive in this case. I was glad to see that Adam did as well. Captive adult dogs, so dogs that we keep in our homes or in our shelters, do appear hesitant to engage with these physical problem-solving tasks in general. And that's whether they're unsolvable, as in past studies, or even whether they're solvable, as in the current study. This may have something to do with the previous scolding history or development or both. Um, but I think the point to think about is that it may not be true that dogs have to be poor physical problem solvers. The question we should ask ourselves is are we conditioning our dogs to be poor physical problem solvers in our homes? When they chew our shoes, when they try to get into our bags, when they try to eat our food, what are we telling them? What feedback are we giving them? And is it really so surprising that for animals whom we control most of their resources, that when they encounter an unfamiliar object in an unfamiliar place, a sealed container with food in it, that they do the safest thing and the thing that we've always taught them to do, which is nothing, don't touch it. Um, and that's exactly what they do. So there's something interesting there. Maybe we're conditioning dependence or deference in some situations. We are also looking now at populations of dogs that are encouraged to problem solve, encouraged to engage in independent activity, and it does look like this population's a little bit better at solving the task, but we still have more data to collect here. So I think sometimes it's important to ask not only just about dog cognition, but also where our knowledge of dog cognition comes from. 
And for the great majority of cognitive research in dogs, our information comes from a very small subset of the population. It comes from dogs that we consider as the pet dog type living in our homes. Um, even this can be broken down into dogs that live indoors with us and have that sort of cushy lifestyle with you know, living in our beds and eating our food versus dogs living maybe in outdoors or maybe working environments or shelter environments. So even this part of the pie can be broken down further. And pet dogs living in the human home are the most tested group. So we have to sometimes question whether this is representative knowledge of a whole species of dogs or subspecies. Um, do we really wanna say dogs do X? when we're really only talking about a small subset of the population in comparison to a much larger population that hasn't been involved in a lot of these same experiences or cognitive tests. Now granted, it is very difficult to test these dogs on a lot of these tests and for obvious reasons, um, but we should be a little bit careful and I think we're all guilty of sort of making that generalization when it might not always be true. So I said before, this is important. It's important that learning is involved because it happens whether or not we intend for it to. Um, and I, I want to drive this point home further because I think it's important. I think um, maybe not among you all, maybe not among the people who are actively seeking and reading the literature and learning about science, but among the general population, I think sometimes there's a misconception that's starting to circulate um, that dogs are born responsive to people or maybe have these special skills, these special social skills that they should develop or they should respond in a certain way to our points or our gestures or our attentional states because they are dogs and not because of their development or their lifetime experiences. Um, and I think that this is so dangerous because while we've talked a lot about things like socialization and the importance of experience here, um, and I think everybody has mentioned that here, I think that's an important point to, to push forward into the general public a little bit more. That you don't just get a dog and have it turn into something that is super pro-social towards people, very responsive to people in every way, and it's just going to be there to please you. This isn't what happens. We need to socialize dogs if we want them to live in close proximity to us. If we want them be, to be responsive to our actions and our gestures and our commands, we need to be consistent. Um, and we need to make sure that what we're communicating, what we're doing is reinforcing those principles. Because they're learning if, if we're doing things that are inconsistent with what we say we want them to be doing. They're learning it anyway. And this is so important because even though these things happen when we don't intend for them to, we can be more intentional. If some of these things are learned, if cognition is shaped by us and our environments, we can sometimes make an intentional choice to help dogs fulfill the capacities that we are discovering. And so just because we find some dogs, some groups, some individuals that can do something doesn't mean that every dog will. It does suggest that there may be an underlying potential or capacity that with the right development, with the right environment, with the right life experience, we can achieve with other dogs, that we can help them reach that potential. And so I'll sort of refer back to the example of Chaser. Chaser knows the names of more than a thousand objects, and this is really impressive. And it's probably held up as, you know, in the last couple of years, one of the best examples of dog cognition. This is something that dogs can do. This is really exciting and really special. But I think we need to also remember, and it is, it's very special. We also need to remember, though, that this was learned. Someone had to train this dog every day, several hours a day, for many years. In fact, a lot of these tests occurred after the Chaser was at the age of three. And so it's not less significant because learning was involved. But we shouldn't just expect our dogs to walk into our house and know the names of a thousand objects. It takes effort. It takes someone to maybe help them reach that potential or at least allow them the opportunity to gain the experiences to show that cognitive capacity. And so I think if we even just compare this to human cognition, this isn't just true for dogs. Um, but if we think about human cognition, when we control so many of the resources of dogs and, and these pet dogs that are in our houses are living like they do, um, we shouldn't be surprised that our actions, our environments are impacting their cognition any more than we would be surprised if someone told us that our actions, our experiences, the environments that we're setting up are influencing our children's cognition. We're setting up those environments for them to grow from the potential that they have. Um, and so when we think of the things that humans can achieve with the things that we view as you know, being related to our cognitive ability, the greatest artists, architects, 
medicine, you know, mathematics. People, too, have to learn. They have to study these things, train these things. They go to school for many, many years, and they practice them to get good at them. Um, and so if you, you want your dog to excel in something um, and you think that it has the potential, it still doesn't mean it doesn't require work. You still need to put that work into it. And the dog needs to be given the opportunity. So I think one of the most special things about dog cognition, and I think this is true of, of the world's dogs, is that it is adaptable, individual, contextual, and influenced by us, either indirectly or directly. Um, and so this is what, in part, allows dogs to survive in many different niches, to be you know, in the villages succeeding, or in our homes, um, or in the streets, or in dumps. Doesn't mean that every dog will be successful, but as a, as a species or subspecies, they seem to be doing quite well. And I think this ability to be flexible and adaptable um, is, is really important. And learning in itself is an evolutionary adaptation um, that allows them to succeed and thrive in this way. And I think we as a group, especially those of us that work with dogs a lot or maybe have our own dogs, recognize that when I ask you to picture the average dog, that no two people in this room will probably picture the same dog. We have this individual variability, this variation between the types of dogs we picture and also their behaviors. And it's important, I think, for everyone to recognize that scientists see this too. We see the data, we see the individual variability, even if we talk about it sometimes in terms of averages. I think the point is maybe we need to do a better job communicating that, that there is the individual variability and we do see it, um, and maybe focus a little bit more on where that comes from. So we can help you guys and we can have conversations with everyone about um, how this can be applied to the individuals that most trainers and most owners are working with. We're often working with individuals. And so how does this all impact them? And hopefully some of this data has given you an idea of the range of responses you can get and some of the life experiences that might push individuals in one direction versus another. So I think in applied settings especially, we need to challenge ourselves to think about our dogs in terms of their individual predispositions, tendencies, environments, and histories, but also respect individual differences and talk in terms of cognitive potential and instead of talking about just cognition, as if every dog has the same one or behaves in the same way. In other words, we really need to consider the potential each dog has and, and see if what we can do with that potential. And since no dog is, or no individual dog is truly average, um, my challenge to you is to try to foster the exceptional. And I would like to thank um, all of these people who have made this research possible and also my collaborators and students. But I would also like to thank Prescott and all of the other individuals here that have put on Sparks this year. I feel very honored to be a part of this first conference and I look forward to many more. Thank you.